Hello everyone, I'm Tiffany Beers and I'd like to welcome you to this special event which is part of the Sotheby's Talk series in collaboration with Jing Daly and organized in partnership with Intelligence Square. It's probably fair to say that sneakers express individuality and personal identity more than any other fashion item. Today, we are going to be discussing how sneakers have become such a massive cultural phenomenon. With record-selling prices of well over a million dollars, we will also be exploring how collecting sneakers has become a multi-billion dollar industry and looking into what is driving the value for these assets and whether sneakers are a good way to diversify one's assets. Lastly, we're going to have a quick look at what performance, how performance impacts collectability. I myself have over 15 years in the sneaker industry, including time at Nike, making sneaker reviews on YouTube, and helping Allison Felix start the brand Seish. In my time at Nike, I led innovation and development for the Nike Mag, the 2016 Nike Mag with auto lacing, the HyperAdapt, the AJ29, the Air Yeezy One, and many more. More recently, I helped Allison Felix start her brand Seish by sourcing and developing the Seish One and the Spike One that she uh, won gold and bronze in the Tokyo Olympics this past summer. Joining me in the attempt to demystify the sneaker market, I'm delighted to have with me three brilliant speakers with whom I'm sure you're going to have a, we're going to have a fascinating conversation. In Palm Beach, we have Miles Nadal, who is the founder and executive chairman of Peerage Capital, a, philanthrop a philanthropist and an avid collector of sneakers and classic cars. His Dare to Dream collection is home to some of the world's rarest cars, related automotive memorabilia, and sneakers. Welcome, Miles. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be part of this. Awesome. And in New York, we have Jeff Staple, who is the founder and CEO of Reed Art Department, formerly known as Staple Design, the New York-based pioneering streetwear brand with the infamous Pigeon logo. He founded the Experiential Lifestyle Boutique, Reed Space, in 2002, and is also the creator and host of Hype Beast podcast, The Business of Hype. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. Really happy to be here and excited to get into this conversation. And also in New York, we have Brom Wachter, Sotheby's head of streetwear and modern collectibles, responsible for Sotheby's expansion into the sneaker and sports memorabilia spaces. Welcome, Brom. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for, for having me. Super excited to be here. Awesome. A big welcome and thank you to all our guests. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge the great loss this week of Virgil Abloh. He was such an influence in the sneaker community and the fashion uh, industry. We are deeply saddened but grateful for his amazing contributions. He'll be greatly missed. Now, to get started, let's start with what are you all wearing? Jeff, what do you have on today? Me, fir me first. Um, well, I don't know if this constitutes as a sneaker, but I have a pair of Crocs on. Um, <laughs> this is uh, the Crocs that was designed by Beams, which is one of the coolest stores in Japan. Uh, and you'll see it is a very interesting looking Croc with a pocket and utility hooks and stuff like that. So uh, throughout this pandemic, I've been wearing a lot of Crocs. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And Miles, how about you? Well, I'm embarrassed to tell you I just took them off, um, but I was wearing a custom pair of Air Jordan 1 Chicago's, but golf shoes. Uh, I had a pair of Air Jordan 1 Chicago's made into golf shoes, so that's what I was wearing today. Nice. Brom, how about you? So I got some, uh, some Para Dunk Low SBs here. Uh, my sister just gave them to me for my birthday. Uh, so sentimental and... Uh, yeah, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm wearing today. Nice. Well, today I'm wearing the Fluffy Dasher by Allbirds. Um, you can't get much more comfortable, uh, I think, than this one right here. So uh, quite the collection of shoes we're all wearing today. All right. So, Jeff, let's start with you. What do you think started the desire to start collecting sneakers? Um, well, I mean, it started really young. You know, if you go way back... Um, me, like probably a lot of other young people, they bought shoes and wore them for their intended purpose, right? You buy basketball shoes to play basketball, you buy gym shoes to go to the gym, and when they get destroyed, you throw them away and you buy a new one. It was a, it was a commodity item, not too different than toilet paper, <laughs> right? And uh, something happened um, in, 
when I was in the sixth grade when the Air Jordan 3 came out. Um, obviously, the Air Jordan 1 is a, is a very important shoe, very pinnacle uh, icon of sneaker culture. But back then, you know, I dare say that the Air Jordan 1 was like a derivative of, you know, an Air Force One or a Dunk. It, it was cool and interesting in color. And of course, you had the goat behind it. But in terms of sneaker design, it wasn't like this major shift. When the Air Jordan 3 came out, to me, it was like really an evolutionary shift in sneaker vocabulary design. Um, it was the first time that I had ever asked, who made these shoes? Who designed this shoe? This is like probably the first time I literally ever put the words design and sneaker together. Before that, I just thought shoes like sort of came out of a sausage maker. Um, and, and then you start to learn about Michael Jordan and his design sessions with Tinker Hatfield and the inspiration of fighter jets behind it. And this was the thing that really sparked my head. Um, and I remember wearing them, uh, the Air Jordan 3, into my sixth grade social studies class um, and having all 35 kids in the classroom look down at my feet at the exact same time, including Mr. Olson, the social studies teacher. So I like snapped 35 necks at once. And it was that feeling that made me a sneakerhead for the rest of my life. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. So sixth grade, what year was that roughly, Jeff? Um, 90? No, no, I'm sorry, okay. 80, 80, 85. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So, so then take us to the pigeon dunk because arguably the a lot of people think the desire and the collecting started with the pigeon dunk. But having designed it, t tell us about it. Tell us also about. Yeah. You know, it got got quoted as a riot. Like, what what happened? Yeah. So I mean, I think if you ask a lot of the newer generation, um, sneaker culture and sneaker collecting began with this shoe, the Nike pigeon dunk, which um, I had the honor of designing, and I say honor because growing up as a fan of Nike, to have Nike call you and invite you out to Beaverton, which to me was like entering the Wizard of Oz. It was just like a place that you couldn't even imagine going to, you know. Um, Tiffany, I know you're probably like, whatever, it's just, <laughs> you know, <don't, laughs> it's just like my job. But like, no, for me, it was like the Magic Kingdom going there and being able to design a shoe. Um, and really like, you know, the, the brief here was really simple. It was the anniversary of the dunk. And they said, we want you to design a shoe that's dedicated to New York City. Um, and I came up with this idea of a pigeon. And when I presented it to Nike, I remember the team at SB was like, we don't get this. Like we said, New York, I don't understand why there's a pigeon on it. And so I had to explain how like you guys in Beaverton might think New York is, you know, the subway and the Empire State Building and the Statue of Liberty, but like, no New Yorker goes to those these like historic iconic places like but what we do see every day is we are like fighting this battle with this bird every single day of our lives and I said you know if you are from New York and you look at this shoe you will immediately know that this is a New Yorker shoe and kudos to the Nike team for being like we don't get it but we believe you so let's just go for it right I mean you could imagine Someone in Beaverton believing this kid in, in New York that, like, we're going to put a pigeon on a shoe and make it represent the city of New York, that was pretty gutsy of them, and, and I appreciate that trust that they had. Um, and then, of course, when we released the shoe in February of 2005, uh, it was a monumental release situation. Kids were sleeping outside of our store for five days in February. It, it was, there was a blizzard occurring at the time. They were sleeping outside, and then... On the release day, February 22nd, 2005, um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which side of the fence you're on, NYPD came, SWAT came, arrests were made, uh, weapons were drawn, uh, fighting broke out. There was a lot of chaos. Um, and the crazy thing is, as you see here, it was covered the next day by the New York Post. It was on the evening news of all the channels on the networks that evening. And so it was the first time in history that regular folk, meaning non-sneakerheads, people that don't own 50 pairs of shoes or more, were like, sneaker riot? What, people are fighting for shoes? I don't understand what's going on. This is, to them, still that commodity item like toilet paper that they use and throw away, use and throw away. So why are people fighting for these? In fact, part of the reason why the cops showed up is because they thought we were dealing drugs out of our store because that there was this like, huge lineup you know they were like what are you giving away for free what are you selling and I was like sneakers and the cops didn't believe me and this was part of the problem that because they started arresting people for disturbing the peace um, 
But yeah, that really put sneaker culture on the map for many people, uh, for better or for worse, I'd say, you know, because a lot of people will say that the culture really shifted after the Pigeon Dunk uh, release. Yeah. So then tell us about what the Dunk and a, and a couple of these other models that, that were Yeah, so it's, it's pretty dope because um, after creating this monumental moment with the Pigeon Dunk, they came back a couple of years later with this shoe called the What the Dunk. Um, which is uh, an amalgamation of all the greatest Dunk SBs sort of Frankenstein together on one shoe. So both the left and the right look completely different. And I was really honored that they asked if it was okay to put the pigeon on the What the Dunk, which you can see right there that we did. So that was really amazing. Uh, and then nearly a decade later, uh, we came back with the black pigeon Dunk. So this was a great reset, um, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, at this point now, between 2005 and 2007 to 2017, sneaker culture had now become this multi-billion dollar industry. And when I say that, I want to I you know, sort of clarify that. Sneaker industry, of course, has always been a multi-billion dollar industry. What I'm talking about is like the collecting and reselling of sneakers became a multi-billion dollar industry. I think I read a statistic that the resale value on Air Jordans is bigger than the entire company of Skechers. Just to put that in the perspective. The secondary market is bigger than, the, than a brand, you know? Um, so at this point, the culture had, had, had exploded, and so we wanted to revisit the Pigeon Dunk, but really put a reset on it, which is why we made it completely all black, but the details in the shoe are really amazing when you have it in your hand. Uh, and then we came back a couple of years after that with the, uh, with the Nike Panda Pigeon, this was great because at this point in time now, as you can see, this picture was actually taken in Chengdu, China. Uh, this is a release for a sneaker, people. There's probably 1,500 people in attendance. At, this is at a store. I'm at a store in a shop. This is a shopping plaza. And this is like inside the mall. <laughs> and I'm just like saying, is this what you want, people? Um, and this was cool because, you know, I'm a New Yorker, but I'm of Chinese descent. And I, I proposed to Nike this idea where I wanted to do a shoe um, that was inspired by my heritage. And for the first time, I wanted to drop this shoe first in China. China actually traditionally gets shoes last. Usually, like, the, the U.S. and uh, European markets get shoes first, and then China gets last. I wanted this shoe, out of respect for my heritage, to come out first in China, and then I wanted New York to get it last. So I flipped the script on the pigeon dunk, kind of like reflecting on the OG. And so, like, I did this whole tour where I went to China first, dropped it there, then we came back at the last stop and did it in New York City, which was a lot of fun to do. So it's been a great journey with, with Nike to be able to um, just uh, apply this pigeon motif and give it uh, wings, if you will, um, on all these different products. Jeff, that's is this the super part where you tell us that everybody gets a free pair that's on this panel? <laughs> <laughs> Miles might have a better shot at procuring them than, than me, I think. <laughs> Love it. As That's long as you're prepared Jeff. to pay, you can get anything you want. I have figured out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so Jeff, let's talk about luxury brands. Like so, mm -hmm. so you talked about the beginning. So so when did like Louis Vuitton, Balenciaga, Prada start to enter? Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that's become a really like new, news noteworthy uh, topic as of late. But actually, it's been going on for a really long time. You know, I can remember back in like. I want to say the late 90s, early 2000s, when Prada had a shoe, uh, I believe it's called the America's Cup shoe. Um, yep, there it is there, 97, yeah. I mean, you know, this is a 25-year-old shoe now, and this was the hottest shoe out. If you remember on the back of the shoe, there was a red bar tab that went down the heel. And everyone who was everyone, you know, like sort of rap culture and urban culture, like if you had made some sort of modicum of success, you were rocking these like Prada's America Cup sneakers, you know, and you could see the whole fit that even this model's wearing it in is just with like casual, you know, pants and like white athletic tube socks and he's got on a pair of like $800 sneakers, you know. So this is not necessarily a brand new thing about like the merging of sneakers and luxury market. Um, luxury brands have been playing and dabbling in sneaker culture for a while now. I remember uh, even, you know, um, uh, Bottega Veneta had a great pair of slip-ons that looked like a pair of Vans, but with the Bottega uh, weave going on. Um, but the interesting thing is I think the sneaker brands have only just recently begun to 
publicly and visibly embrace luxury market. Um, and, you know, that's exhibited by just, you know, we mentioned Virgil Abloh, rest in peace. Um, but just in his latest collection is when he first premiered uh, the very first Nike Louis Vuitton collaboration. I mean, you know, OGs like Dapper Dan in the 80s in Harlem were doing this like, you know, for 30, 40 years ago, they were sort of doing it on a bootleg basis. Um, and, you know, Nike's not a dumb company. They, they saw that. But it really took decades and decades for them to finally get around to like, okay, let's really make this official. And I believe it's because, you know, um, the Nikes and Adidas's of the world want to hang their hats so much on athletics and performance and really luxury and fashion and trend are almost like the polar opposite of that. I think there was a little bit of fear of like brand dilution if they were to, you know, embrace the fashion market. But um, now that those cultures, you know, to me, thankfully, because of street culture, they've merged everything together so much that you just can't deny that the kid is just going to wear, you know, like fashion brands, athletic brands all at the same time. We're all sort of like mixing in the same pot now. OK, so so Bram, turning to you then. So how did sneakers enter the collectibles market? Well, I, I think that, you know, so long as these products are sort of being put out there, um, you know, people will always collect and there are always people out there that, that want to buy. Um, so it doesn't matter, you know, if you think about somebody who goes to the store in 1985 and buys an original pair of Air Jordan 1s. And then, you know, every year after that, as the Air Jordan 2, 3, 4, etc. come out, goes and buys one, you know, there's always really a collector. But I think some things have happened, you know, over the last 30 years, right, that have um, really moved sneakers from something that you wear, like Jeff was talking about, something that's not necessarily just an item that's disposable, um, into a collecting thing. And, and, and that, in many ways, is reflected by the actions of the companies themselves. You know, so if you look at the Nike mag, you know, the, the Back to the Future mag, and, and we've, we've sold these at Sotheby's before, we've sold signed ones, unsigned ones. And, and Tiffany, I think you, you know, might know all about this particular model, as I know you were the innovator behind it. Um, but this is a sneaker, right? Of course, it can be worn, but in, in many ways, it is also really a collectible. Um, and it was meant, I think, in some ways, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, to also be collected and to withhold the test of time. And so because it's made for that purpose, it really has been um, collected like that. Um, and of course, you know, you see PJ Tucker walking into a game wearing them, and, and many amazing people have worn them before. But I think they're a little bit of both. Um, and especially when I sort of think about what, what Jeff was talking about in terms of sneakers as luxury items, you know, I, I typically um, never even think of them that way. I think of them as, you know, just because of my job where we're getting these really insane pairs, I, I think of them more as either something that you wear or a really valuable collectible, um, sort of depending on value. Um, and... I do think, though, that like Jeff was saying, you know, it's this we're sort of seeing now with, you know, the Dior collaboration, the, you know, the Vuitton collaboration that, you know, this this sort of role as, hey, this is a collectible. This is a luxury item. Sometimes the value is high. Um, is sort of being recognized. And so I think it's super interesting. OK, so then can you share some more examples uh, of shoes that have that have been in the collectibles that that kind of told you that this was like, this is a, this is a serious big time collectible. Yeah, for sure. So, um, one great example, um, is earlier this year, uh, we sold Kanye West's Grammy, um, Air Yeezy that he wore in 2008. Um, and sort of what was not a, a breakout performance, but certainly a, a very memorable performance for him at the 50th annual Grammy Awards. Um, and this was sort of the time that the world was introduced to the Yeezy. Um, Tiffany, again, I know I don't need to tell you about this, is you were there and helped create and build this shoe for Nike. Um, so, you know, probably no one better in the world to be talking to about it. Um, but, you know, we obviously put that to market this year. Um, it sold for $1.8 million. So it's currently the highest price ever paid for, for any pair of sneakers. Um, and, you know, I think in many ways it was just a, a reflection of the historical importance of that item, right? Um, so, you know, if you think about, you know, Michael Jordan walking onto court, you know, the first time in a pair of Air Jordans, 
you know, if you had the sneakers from that game, what, what, what is the, you know, what is the historical importance of that? It's like, well, the Yeezy brand is massive. It is the biggest, you know, competition to the Jordan brand. And this is what introduced that to the world. So that was obviously huge. Um, you know, we, we also sold, um, just this year, a pair of game worn and signed airships for, for $1.5 million. And, um, you know, that was the earliest game worn pair of sneakers by Michael Jordan. Um, you know, and, and before that, we obviously, you know, Miles will talk about it later. We sold, you know, the moon shoes for 437,500. Um, and so all of these things we're, we're seeing that, you know, there's real cultural importance placed on these items. People, people value them. Obviously people wear them, but also they're, they're valued as art, as design, um, and really as a collectible. And, and we've been super focused on that. All right. So Miles, let's, let's bring you into the conversation now. So when did you start collecting sneakers and what was it that triggered your interest? So I, I'm pretty new to this. I've been a collector for about uh, since June of 2019. So just about two and a half years. Um, I, I would say it happened serendipitously. Um, we are the largest Sotheby's International Realty franchisee in the world. And I had gone to uh, Vancouver in March of 2019 uh, for the Global Real Estate Conference of Sotheby's. And I met uh, the Global Chief Marketing Officer of Sotheby's, the um, auction house named Noah Wunsch. And um, subsequently in like June, early June of 2019, I was reading the New York Post on a Saturday, um, uh, sitting on my sofa at our country house. And I read that Sotheby's was auctioning off a hundred of the most iconic sneakers called the Ultimate Sneaker Collection. So I sent him a text and I said, I have this significant car collection. We have a museum. It would be very cool to get some sneakers because we had had some exposure to sneakers because I was in the advertising business. We did some work for Nike and Adidas and Reebok and Skechers. Um, and I said, okay, it'd be cool to get a half a dozen pair to have on display with the other um, automotive collectibles that we have, such as jackets and hats and suits and racing um, shoes, et cetera. And so he sent me a note back that said, look, you here are the half a dozen that I think are most um, collectible and uh, most worthy of collecting. And he said, but by the way, you can buy the whole collection now um, privately. And I said, okay, th that'd be cool. But, uh, so I could only buy 99, uh, the hundredth, which was the moon shoe, uh, which was the most desirous of the whole, uh, collection was going to be auctioned on a Tuesday. So I, I came down, um, and that was the Bill Bowerman, you know, he was the co-founder of Nike and in 72, he and his wife designed these in their kitchen and it was made with the waffle iron that you see in the photograph. And um, these were the only unworn pair. And um, so they were going to auction those off. I bought the, 90, the other 99, which were, in my opinion, iconic and worthy of collecting. I didn't know what I'd do with them, but I thought it'd be very cool to have them. So on the Tuesday, I had flown from Toronto. And I, I remember this vividly. I was coming down to do an interview with the New Yorker magazine. And um, I got out of the Uber and I was wearing a navy suit, navy blue and uh, powder blue tie and a powder blue shirt. And I was wearing a pair of Royals and uh, got out of the, the, the Uber. And these uh, construction workers started yelling at me, hey, dude, rocking the sneaks, man. And I was like, wow, why would anyone even care? Like I was not aware of what was happening. <laughs> and I guess they thought, here's this middle-aged guy wearing a suit and a pair of sneakers. Um, that was, you know, unexpected. So when I went in for the interview, the, I guess the writer from the New Yorker magazine said, had watched this happen, um, unbeknownst to me. And he said, what did you think? And I said, I guess, you know, people that are collectors don't think that just regular, average, everyday people are that into sneaker collecting. And I remember Noah once said to me at the time, you have no idea what you've happened upon. And I think subsequently that article and the whole coverage that Sotheby's implemented globally has had about a billion impressions. And so it was shocking to me. I knew that there were sneaker heads that really loved sneakers. Um, what has happened in the two and a half years since I've started collecting is, um, sport and fashion have now met on the street. And now 
you find, I mean, even my children or my wife will wear dresses with sneakers and um, they'll wear them as a fashion statement. I don't think in the two and a half years that I started collecting, I've ever not worn a pair of sneakers uh, with a suit or a tuxedo or a pair of trousers or jeans or whatever. And um, I'm a, I guess one would call a middle-aged person. I'm 63 years old. So it's very interesting. I, I, I always said that, you know, I didn't know what was happening. And all my friends who collect cars or watches or wine or art have said to me, wow, that was brilliant. How did you know? And the reality is I didn't know. I just did it because I thought it would be fun and cool to do. And I thought, gosh, what a nice thing to have. And unbeknownst to me, there were like, millions and millions of people who love sneakers from the ages of eight to 80 and um, male and female. And that was something that was unexpected. I thought our car collection was pretty cool and neat and unique. Uh, but I think for every inquiry we get to show our, our car collection, um, we get more interest, probably three or four to one to show the sneaker collection. Um, and, and that was something that was really quite shocking to me. Um, when we, so we started and we only had a hundred sneakers. Then I hired a gentleman named Sean Go, and he's the curator of our, 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 our collection, um, the ultimate sneaker collection. And uh, his job is a pretty cool job. It's to research sneakers, um, to buy sneakers on our behalf and to display them and to write about them and to show them to underprivileged kids. And we've done a cartoon book. Um, we've now got a program where we're going to donate, we donate sneakers and let uh, kids less fortunate be able to uh, design their own sneakers. And then ultimately, um, during COVID, I had some consternation. Here I am, you know, we're up to about 800 pairs of sneakers. And um, I thought, okay, what, what am I going to do that's, you know, good for society? So uh, when I bought the uh, Air George Chicago's that were autographed, I think from his 84 season, um, we paid a lot of money and I thought, okay, what, what can I do that would be beneficial to uh, share the good fortune? And so we decided to contribute all of our sneakers to something called the Dare to Dream Foundation, uh, which we own. And then upon my um, death, uh, hopefully a long time from now, and many thousands of sneakers from now, uh, we will have Sotheby's auction them off and all the proceeds will go to underprivileged kids so that they can share in some of the benefit. Uh, but I guess even in the two and a half years that I've been collecting, I have seen the merging, as Jeff articulated, between sport and fashion and design and pop culture all merged together. And now it, it, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, I jokingly say if I had a $10,000 pair of alligator shoes and I walked into a restaurant, nobody would care and notice you walk in with a pair of $300 sneakers and it's amazing how people go crazy. I've actually started something else. Um, I, I decided that my most favorite sneakers I'd like to have made into golf shoes. So I have the uh, Chicago's and breads and the um, Royals I had made into golf shoes. And you can't believe I could go to Augusta. I could go to Durrell. I could go to Pebble Beach. I could go to wow. Shinnecock. And anywhere I go, I get stopped by the people in the back shop, the caddies or other players saying, hey, dude, where did you get those sneakers? Like, they're unbelievable. Uh, sure. And, and, I'm sure, but, Miles, that's great. But they would have, ne they would never, I guess, because it's unexpected. So yeah. it's become yeah. a lot of fun. Wow. Amazing What's funny collection. Is I'm the person that stops people, you know, because I'm so used to seeing these things to sell them that. You know, I'm always like, oh, my God, look at those Air Jordans 11s. You know, like, I'm, like, what are, like, you know, I'm constantly complimenting people. I'm like, oh, you have the Hyper Royals. I love them. And so people are always, like, you know, a little taken aback. But at the same time, I just, I don't stop doing it. So we did something else that was intelligent um, uh, inadvertently. Um, every five years, we usually do a book about something, usually around uh, quotes. And uh, this time we did a book called The Ultimate Sneaker Collection where art and design meet on the street. And um, it was all about the evolution of sneaker culture, going back to Run DMC and uh, Converse and uh, early Adidas and how it evolved into Air Jordans, et cetera. And when we did the book and we did the research on it, 
it was quite fascinating to actually see how sneaker culture has evolved. And it has evolved in a very sophisticated but very unexpected way. And the recent uh, integration of fashion and sneaker culture is one that has taken a whole twist of, um, of appeal and broadening the, uh, the application of what people think is for music or art or fashion or uh, you know urban, uh, urban culture. And I think it's just the beginning. Someone said, I think in 2010, um, sneaker collecting was about a billion dollar business. I think it's a five or six billion dollar business. But someone said by, I think I read a statistic that by 2030, it's going to be a $30 billion business. I mean, we yeah, didn't do so this because we thought we would create something valuable. We did this because it would be fun. I do hope it's going to be very valuable because it, it'll enable us to give a lot more money to charity and help yeah. those less fortunate. But, you know, the museum that you see behind us has capacity for about 2,000 pairs of sneakers. And wow. um, the idea was to just create something similar to the Apple Store. Uh, if you can see, it's got virtual... Uh, it, it's just a, it, you only have one side attached to the glass. So they're like floating shelves. And uh, it, it's, it's it was something beautiful. that we just did for ourselves. But now when people come in to have meetings, like we, we, we actually have a meeting room inside the sneaker museum, like right inside, uh, people would sooner be there than anywhere else in the whole place. And that was a, 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 an expectation that we did not have. We, we under we just never thought about you know the broad appeal that sneaker culture had yeah and it continues to broaden so you know i think taking a step back like the purpose of sneakers um typically has been performance and in my background like performance like we designed for performance we engineered them performance like it was such a big deal so so Brom, from a from a st seller standpoint, can you speak to how high performance? So so Miles mentioned some game worn shoes. You know, there's like obviously Michael Jordan wearing a pair of shoes, and then we have entertainers wearing shoes. Can you speak to how the high performance shoes sell um, versus lifestyle, or is it even a thing? Yeah. So you know, it's funny. I, I I've been thinking about this question a lot. Um, and it's something that I, I talk a lot about with Jordan Geller as well. He goes by Shoeseum and is you know probably one of the most knowledgeable Nike experts in the world. And he, he thinks a, a lot about performance and you know has, has sort of oriented my thinking a lot towards it as well. What I would say is that on, on specific models where um, you know there is historical importance in the performance. So if you think about the moon shoe, right, and the waffle sole, the innovation of the waffle sole and how that created traction with the track, you know, performance is an important part of the value because it was really that innovation that made that sneaker, you know, the first real breakout sneaker for Nike, so important. Um, if you think about Michael Johnson's gold track shoes, right, that we sold this past summer at Sotheby's, those are made to perform. They're so incredibly light. Every single material is thought about. Um, they're obviously an iconic look. So, you know, that sneaker, right, the, a lot of its value is tied up both in who wore it, but also the performance aspect. But I would say the, the vast majority, I would say 95% of sneakers that are, that are valuable aren't driven by performance. They're really driven by, you know, either cool collaborations or you know, historical importance, whatever it may be. Um, but I would say on a very specific subset, yes, it, it does It does drive some value. Okay, interesting. So then let's talk about sneakers as a way, I can't even believe I'm saying this, as a way to diversify your assets. Who's buying and what are the key drivers in this market? So I think the, the group of, of people that are buying, it's, it's pretty diverse from, you know, finance, um, private equity, um, real estate, you know, um, advertising, marketing. I mean, there's a lot of people in a variety of different businesses that, that find these assets um, really interesting. And, you know, that may be because, hey, if I'm working at a hedge fund, there, there may be similarities between the sneaker market and other markets, which there certainly are. You know, if you announce, if we announce that, you know, a Paris dunk sells in our Paris auction for $95,000, which it did, 
it's not shocking that you know a few weeks later, a month later, another one sells for 110,000 because that precedent and that market price has been set. Um, we we never you know as, as a company advise on you know I- investing in assets, but you know I, w- I will say that the you know the market has been very strong since 2019. Obviously, everything has you know its its ups and low ups and downs, um, but. You know the the market has been you know super bullish over the last year. I just want to add that like what's really unique to me about um, sneakers versus other kind of like assets is the intrinsic tie between the street and then the investment portion of it, right? So if you look at fine art or watches or fine wine, they sort of exist in like a bubble onto themselves, but the tie between an Air Force One going for, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars and the guy on Fulton Street in Brooklyn wearing that Air Force One are intrinsically tied. Like if the streets stop representing the shoe, then the top also collapses. You know, it's not like sort of the other things. Um, So I think that's what's really unique about sneakers, that they sort of are tied in this high-low aspect is really cool about it. Yeah, I would have um, a, a, another perspective as as an investor, uh, as a guy in, you know, private equity and uh, real estate and uh, other asset classes. I think a lot of the new collectors are from you know Wall Street. Um, they come from areas where they have done very well through investing activities, and I think they've enjoyed significant appreciation the same way they have collecting watches or cars. But as an asset class, I mean, you couldn't put to work a hundred million dollars. Say, I want to build a world-class sneaker collection or a two hundred million dollar or a five hundred million dollar, um, you know, collection. That that's not the market's not that big. You could do that in real estate. You could do that in um, fixed income or uh, securities or hedge funds or you know venture capital. Um, Having said that, it is, I would say, the appreciation in the two and a half years, I bet you, as an alternative asset class, has probably done better than any other alternative asset in terms of its appreciation. Now, if it becomes a $30 billion market in the next um, seven years, then it becomes a lot more meaningful. I have been approached by people who say, I'd like to build a fund and we're going to buy, we're going to offer pieces of both the most iconic sneakers, et cetera. Um, but as a pure investable asset, I don't think the marketplace is big enough. Having said that, the people who have the good fortune to buy things that they love, admire and appreciate, and where they are enjoying wearable, walkable art, which is how we view sneakers, wearable, walkable art, um, they will see significant appreciation um, not only at a point in time, but over a period of time, both in the short, medium, and long term. Because the minute you say to people, there is limited de- uh, supply, you all of a sudden have a spike in demand. And if you say this is for friends and family only, then you get hysteria, uh, as Jeff experienced. You know, And so, um, in, especially post-COVID, you've seen whether it's in watches or cars, or sneakers or other collectibles where there is limited availability, you have a dramatic increase in um, in appeal. And also, it's not usually a price point which is so out of reach. It's not a Richard Mille watch for a million dollars. I mean, yeah. so it, it is something that is sometimes aspirational for young people, uh, but it's not so outrageous that someone says, I could never think of owning a a pair of Air Jordan 1 Chicago's. Like, it's just out of my reach forever. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, so, Brom, with the prices rising and the value rising, like, how do you think that's impacting? Is that a good thing for the market, the consumers, the brands? Well, I actually, you know, to take a different stance here, I actually, uh, sometimes I think that when, when I see something like a pigeon dunk and it, and it goes for, you know, we, we sold pigeon dunk number one, um, a month and a half ago for $90,000. Um, I actually think that in that case, that's an art object and an artifact that deserves to be appreciated, you know, in, in the same way that a Banksy deserves to be appreciated. Um, I do get a little bit sad, you know, 
when I go to a store and I want to buy a pair of Dunk Lows and they have no Dunk Lows, you know, or they don't have any Air Jordans or, you know, you just can't go in anymore to a store and just buy a pair of sneakers. And that is sad. And, you know, I don't think that sort of sometimes all of the, the resale, all that we're driving in resale can be prohibitive to people who really just want sneakers because they love sneakers and want to wear them. Um, that, that can be hard. Um, and you know, I think that Nike, from what I at least have seen and what I've heard, it sounds like they're, they're very aware of that. And, you know, it seems they're, they're making an effort to increase the supply, um, to, to create, um, a situation where while items are limited, like they are with the, you know, recent off-white, um, you know, dunk drop where there were 50 lots, um, you know, when you release that many lots and each one of those maybe on its own is pretty limited, but you're doing 50 different pairs, right? Um, that increases the supply and ultimately allows them to be a little bit more affordable, even in the secondary market. Um, so I guess what I would say is when I think about the really, really incredible stuff, you know, the things that Michael Jordan wore in his first game or that helped launch a brand or, you know, are super culturally important, I think it's fantastic that that they're kind of getting the the recognition that that fine art is. Um, I think where it prevents people from just getting a pair of sneakers because they love sneakers and want to wear them, that that to me is like sad. And sometimes on a personal level, you know, it's hard for me to get sneakers. So you, you also have yeah, a I, unique I, in, you also have a unique environment currently. I mean, post COVID, you have an environment where. If you go to buy a used or new car, there's none available. You go to buy, um, I went to a watch store yesterday. I went to a Rolex store. They normally have 100 to 200 watches on display. They didn't have a single solitary watch for sale. They had a dozen um, dummy watches that were just examples, and you had to place an order, and they could not give you delivery they thought delivery would be within six to 18 months. So you have a very unique environment right now where anything um, that people wanna own or collect is in scarce supply. Um, it, you know, if you look also in the sneaker business, um, right now, because of the supply chain issues, Nike announced um, that they weren't going to be shipping uh, to a lot of the stores, the independent stores. Um, there, so there is a scarcity of, of supply currently because of supply chain issues uh, ca caused by yeah. COVID. So I, I, look, the one nice thing is if you want to own sneakers, no matter who you are, you can always own a lovely pair of sneakers. They may cost you $100. But sometimes what's interesting is the $100 low, you know, a, a pair of, you know, off, you know, just white on white, low, down, low cut sneakers. With a pair of jeans, people think you're really fashionable, and they're hundred dollars. And um, yeah. I, I I buy two pairs of sneakers for That's every true. single employee in the organization, so they can wear them uh, in our museum because our, our 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 floors are white and they stain readily. And I'll tell you, if you see people with hundred dollar, two hundred dollar, two hundred fifty dollar pair of sneakers, um, you, you'd go, wow, that that guy's cool. Like that woman's really got style. And and so you don't have to own. Um, you know, uh, Air Force One, you know, Virgil Abloh off-whites uh, to, to, to look fashionable. Um, and you don't have to go to, uh, uh, you know, any yeah. exotic, the Dior's or something where people say, wow, that's really amazing. You, you really got style. Because 95 or 98% of the people that you see in a restaurant or on the street there are very few people that are like you three that really know exactly <laughs> what they are and what they cost. Yeah, so so that brings up um, another great point. Like there are, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's roughly 25 million pairs of shoes made every year. Now, current supply chain situations aside, but in general, there's millions of shoes made every year. So I guess, Jeff, directing this question to you, what do you think about sustainability in this field? Like, personally, I care a lot about it, and I know I'm paying attention to how many pairs I have because I don't want to be excessive. But, but what are your thoughts when it comes to collecting and shoes and designing and sustainability? 
Yeah, I mean, me as a working designer, I'm really cognizant of the products that I'm putting out in the world, uh, and I'm trying to get myself educated um, on sustainability and doing things that don't have as much of a carbon impact. Um, in fact, last year, we did a project with Allbirds uh, where we were the first um, streetwear fashion brand to collaborate with Allbirds. In fact, Allbirds historically doesn't really collaborate with anyone or anything. You know, they, they're doing their own thing. It's really amazing what they're doing and the growth that they've had in the very short amount of time that they've been in existence. Um, I connected with Tim Brown, who's the founder of Allbirds, and we got along really well. And we thought that there was an opportunity here to sort of bridge the very um, hyper niche, you know, streetwear, hype beast world with what these guys were doing at Allbirds. And um, uh, I'm really happy to say that our launch was extremely successful. Uh, in fact, this Allbirds that you're seeing now is the only pair of Allbirds that you'll see on StockX, just to give you an indicator of how those two worlds linked. Um, and now we're doing more projects together. And it was really cool because in order to even work and collaborate with Allbirds, Staple had to become a carbon neutral company. That's sort of like the terms wow. of engagement for Allbirds. And Allbirds was said, said, we'll help you get there, but you staple has to be carbon negative and that was really cool that's amazing uh you know that's that's just talk incredible. about sticking they to your really, guns right like yeah they stick to no their guns. bs they, they, yep yep yeah that's really tremendous so this is going to be our last question and then we're going to wrap up but as you can see here on this panel we have a full circle of knowledge from designing to making and building to selling and to collecting so now is it possible for this to become formulaic, right? So like if, if Jeff designs a shoe and I make it, Bram, Bram are you going to sell it? And Miles, can you collect it? Like, can we formalize this? Uh, I'll, well, I'll take that first. I mean, I think it's, it's interesting. Yeah. This panel here is really interesting because it is, it is the full circle, right? It's the, it's the design, it's the manufacturing, making, production, the selling, and then the collecting. I personally think that there still is... A, a magic pixie dust and a magic wand that needs to happen because simply for the fact that like look at how many sneaker brands are out there you know there's hundreds of sneaker brands and they all want to be Nike, Adidas, Yeezy and they're all they all have an equal shot at figuring it out but it's not let's call this designer put this developer in sell it in this shop and we're going to have a home run there are many more intangible factors that are involved with that um, that make it something timeless, classic, you know, a forever amazing collectible shoe. It's not something that you can bottle and just pick up off the shelf. Otherwise, every company would be doing it. Um, you know, Miles, you'd have, you'd have a section full of sketchers if that were the case. I guarantee you that. <laughs> well, I come from the advertising business, and, you know, the question always was, what, what's, what advertising is going to, you know, have an impact? There's a famous quote that says, I know my advertising, uh, you know, half my advertising works. I just don't know which half. I think um, it, 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 art and design and what Jeff calls magic pixie dust is more important than the science. Having said that, if there's a brand extension of something that was very famous before, uh, you know, if, 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 if the pigeon dunks, if there's a new iteration, because it's been so successful in the past, it will, the next one will be very successful. But if you talk about creating something de novo from scratch, using you know, any kind of research and science, um, chances are it will not succeed to the extent that you, 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 you hope without the magic pixie dust that Jeff describes um, and, and, and some amount of art and design and cultural understanding and some good fortune. I still think there's an element of luck and serendipity of why something is remarkably um, uh, desirable. Brom, your thoughts? Yeah, so I think just like you've, you've all said, and I think it's really the truth, you know, the things that, that make something really desirable, I think in, in many ways are I impossible to even know or understand. I think timing sometimes makes a really big difference in terms of when it, something is released the reaction that it has, you know, the nostalgia that it creates. You know, if you think about some of the trends in the collectibles market, and nostalgia is certainly one of them, and you think about what is really desired, you know, dead stock, 1985 Air Jordans, you know, in their original box packaging, perfect condition, you know, that, that's nostalgia. And so is Back to the Future, so is the mag. And so, well, I think there are elements you can tap into, and I think the brands have been doing that, um, 
I think that in the end, what, what really makes something super successful is actually exactly like Jeff said. There's like some type of magic in the air and it just works, it clicks, it hits a note. And then, you know, moving into the future, that's what you see the cultural importance be placed on. Um, and so I wish we could come up with a formula between the four of us, but I, I think it would be difficult. <laughs> Well, this has been fantastic. I want to thank all of you, Miles Nadal, Jeff Staple, and Bra Mokter for their brilliant contributions to today's event, to Sotheby's, Jing Daly, and Intelligence Squared for putting it all together. Sotheby's streetwear launch started on December 1st and features a selection of Louis Vuitton and Supreme accessories and clothing sourced in conjunction with Jing Daly's Modern Collectibles division, as well as a single lot online auction of 216 Supreme decks. The auction is open until mid-December. I hope you enjoyed watching. Thank you to everyone for joining us.